Blaine Wilson, Paul Krugman, and Russell Simmons. But first, a panel on ethics in book reviewing includes Christopher Hitchens, Francine Prose, and Sam Tenenhaus. This is about 90 minutes. Thanks, John. Um, this started out because I did a survey years ago in 1988 on, on the ethics of book reviewing. And at the time, when I wrote a note to the audience uh, and to our membership, I, I wrote to the respondent who accused the survey's drafter of being an idiot, I say, you're right, but not for the reason you think. I plan to leave future surveys to large institutions with career bureaucrats and charming duck ponds. Well, I forgot that plan never to do a survey again. And when we started talking, uh, this year about changes in the business and the development of the blogosphere and all of that, we all thought at NBCC that uh, it was time to ask some questions again. In order, we hoped, to have comparative data, uh, we decided to ask about 10 or 12 questions that we had asked back in 1988. Um, unfortunately, since we're um, not statisticians or social scientists and we're book critics, we blew it. Uh, we included an other category we didn't have before, so things don't quite line up. But as far as I'm concerned, all of this is just um, uh, you know, an extended anecdote, and uh, the numbers are fun, but the real idea is to get us thinking about um, issues. Uh, what I want to do, uh, since we do have a, quite a crowd, and um, uh, we're hoping to go to 1 o'clock, at least some of us, if the, uh, the energy is in the room, but uh, we'll break briefly at 12.30 so everybody can go where they need to go because the adver advertisement was for 12.30. I thought the most effective way to do this is to first start with a little bit of performance art. Instead of my introducing everybody, I'll have everyone introduce himself or herself uh, as if they were writing a good critical ID for a review. You know, e.g., you know, Christopher Hitchens is the future author of God is Still Not Great or something like that. Um, and then I will take a couple of minutes just to toss the questions in the air. Uh, I'm not going to give you results because that would eat too much eat up too much time, but I think um, I'd like the questions in the air. I'm then going to ask everybody on the panel to talk for about five minutes toward this subject, individual questions or whether the whole thing is a bunch of malarkey and we shouldn't worry about ethics and book reviewing, and then we'll open it up to, to conversation. So I'd like to start um, just by having the panel introduce itself. Chris, can you begin? Um, Hitchens here. Um, I write... Uh, about uh, books for the Atlantic Monthly. <clears throat> I'm Francine Prose. I'm a novelist and sometime book reviewer. Uh, John Leonard. I write new books column every month for Harper's and uh, and longer reviews for the the New York Review of Books and the Nation. I'm David Eulen. I'm the book editor of the Los Angeles Times. Um, I, I write. For the paper. Before that, I was a freelance reviewer for 20 years. God save me. <laughs> I'm Sam Tannenhaus. I'm the editor of the New York Times Book Review. So hardly any editing needed. Five objective introductions. So we had a 32-question uh, uh, survey, just so, so you have a little bit of numbers at the beginning. Was some, somehow, amazingly, thanks to SurveyMonkey, we got 356 responses to these 32 questions and um, dauntingly because the software has this other category which people immediately ran to not wanting to answer yes no or not sure we have 1836 comments um, you won't hear all of them today uh, the only question that absolutely all 356 people responded to is are you an NBCC member <laughs> so everyone was able to answer that question um, I'm going to just men mention a couple of of things here. Um, the, the survey obviously sought clear-cut answers. Uh, this other category in particular, the invitation to comments, invited people to immediately go there and talk about the nuance, nuances. So probably a 1,000 of these 1,800 comments are, it depends. How can you even ask or something like that? Um, but we still have some numbers. And I'll try to put some of them out if those issues come, come up. Um, both from the old survey and the new one. But uh, here are the questions. I'll try and just reel them off real fast. Should a book review editor assign a book to a casual acquaintance of the author, e.g. someone the reviewer may have met at a writing conference, party, or on a panel, but who is not a close friend? Should a book review editor assign a book to a friend of the author? 
Should a book review editor assign a book on subject A to a reviewer who has also written a book on subject A or a subject extremely close to that? Is it right for book review editors to allow reviewers to request a particular book even though that practice occasionally leads to back scratching and attempted setups? Is, the book review, is it the book review editor's obligation to question a prospective <coughs> excuse me, reviewer about potential conflicts of interest rather than the reviewers to raise the subject? <coughs> is it ethical for a reviewer to decline to review a book he has already accepted for review on the ground that he didn't like the book and doesn't want to say negative things in print? Should anyone mentioned in the acknowledgments of a book be barred from reviewing it? Should authors who publish with a particular house be permitted to review other books published by that house? Should a writer be allowed to review the book of someone who shares the same literary agent? That's a question in which the responses changed enormously from 20 years ago. Should a person who has written an unpaid blurb for a book be allowed to write a fuller review of the book? Should an editor ever assign a book to a reviewer who is known to hold aesthetic, political, or literary views contrary to those of the author? Should an editor ever assign a book to a reviewer who is known to hold aesthetic, political, or literary views similar to the author's? Is it ever ethical to review a book without reading the entire book? <laughs> that, that has stayed fairly consistent, although it's a trick question because it says ever. So if you think it ever is okay, then your answer should be yes. But most people actually changed that and they thought, is it generally ethical to review a book? Anyway. Should literary blogs adhere to the same rules of ethics, whatever the consensus may turn out to be on them, as newspaper book review sections? This is the beginning of the new questions. A lot of those questions were on the earlier survey, too. Should literary journals, serious popular magazines, e.g. The Atlantic, and so-called opinion magazines, e.g. The Nation, adhere to the same rules of ethics, whatever the consensus may turn out to be on them, as newspaper book review sections? Should a literary blogger review the book of another literary blogger to whose blog she or he links? I remember I wrote that he or she, so uh, I guess Survey Monkey is a woman and sort of reverse that. Um, <laughs> all right. Should, should freelance book critics request only those books from publishers that they're likely to review or judge for an award, or is it okay for freelancers to request a much larger number of books? I wrote that terrible question, which is a disjunction, which does not allow a yes or no answer. And so a lot of people immediately fled to other. Um, if you think it's okay for freelancers to request more books than they can review or judge, is it okay for them to sell whichever ones they don't want to keep? Um, I don't know if the Strand person is here. I understand they have an anniversary. So we asked that question in honor of the anniversary. Is it okay to assign a book by author A to reviewer B when author A has served as a major source for B in a book that B has already published, uh, known to us as the Woodward on Tenet question? Is it okay for a book review editor in deciding which books to review to favor books by writers who also review regularly for that book section? Nice, a nice new question. Should a reviewer read other reviews of a book before reviewing it? Is it okay for a reviewer to regularly review books from the same one or two favorite publishing houses? Is it okay for a reviewer to repeatedly review books by the same author over years and even decades? You may notice the shift from um, should to is it okay. A lot of people were upset by that. It's really just elegant variation. Um, but there are some issues there. Should a reviewer sometimes be allowed to crib from his or her past reviews in writing about an author years later? Is it ever, we're almost done. Is, is it ever acceptable for a reviewer not to say what she or he really thinks about a book? Are the ethics of book reviewing in the United States and England significantly different? Now here, I have to say, we're so glad Hitch is here because this was an amazing result, I just have to tell you. Not sure, 73%. So if, if, if he has, for uh, having become an American citizen, if you don't know the answer either, we're completely lost. Um, it is okay, is it okay, and these are a little technical, is it okay for a book review section to both feature an author through a podcast meant to promote traffic to that book section site and also review the author's book at more or less the same time? Given, some of these questions came from our membership, by the way, and I don't understand them myself. Given that some companies pay per post, blog advertise, review me, pay bloggers for reviews of products and services, should any book reviews commissioned in that way be identified as arising out of commissions? Should a review of a book be linked to its Amazon page or any other site that sells the book? 
is a book review that exists exclusively as an MP3 or other type digital audio file less objective than a traditional print review because of its delivery elements, e.g. tone of voice. Is it okay for a newspaper or magazine to review books by current or former staff members? And then this is the last question. Is it okay for a newspaper, book section, or magazine to ignore self-published books that are submitted, e.g. iUniverse type books? So that was the whole survey. I'm now going to ask everybody, maybe in um, alphabetical order, I, I, I guess, um, to talk for about five minutes each on this subject or any questions that interest them. So I guess Christopher would be first. Um, well, I've never been or wanted to be an editor of anything. So I'm not really sure if I can answer any of those questions. I've, those are not the dilemmas I've faced. And I know nothing about podcasting or webcasting. So I can narrow it down to the gutter ethics of Fleet Street, in which I was brought up, um, where the motto, if I remember, was a, it's just only a line, but it's from the, it's from the book of Job. And it says, um, you can look it up. It says, um, oh, that mine enemy would write a book. <laughs> um, because then you know that you'll get to him one of these days. I once opened a copy of the London Spectator to find myself being reviewed. A little book I'd done on the sculpture of the Parthenon uh, it was reviewed by a gentleman called, I can still remember his name, uh, Noel Malcolm, a fellow of Peterhouse, Cambridge who started by accusing me of plagiarism and sort of worked his way on from there. Very anti, um, non-philo-Hellenic um, and non-philo-Hitchens review. And I thought, OK, Mr. Malcolm, Dr. Malcolm, if you insist, that's all very well. But one day you'll write a book. And um, so it came to pass. The Guardian, <laughs> <laughs> the Guardian called me up one day in Washington. It was, must have been 10, 11 years yet later, but it, the memory was still so fresh. And they said, um, you're busy this week. And I said, I'm incredibly busy. They said, we just want you to review a book. I said, I can't take on anything this week. They said, well, it's a pity. Can you suggest anyone else to review Noel Malcolm's book on uh, what? I said, hold on, just, just a second. <laughs> just a second. I said, no, no, it's OK. Sling it over. I said, over it. <laughs> I sat up late with it. It was, one of the, it was about Bosnia. It was one of the best books I've ever read. I had no choice but to say so. It still rankles that I had to do that. <laughs> I remember being commiserated with by one of Sam's predecessors at the New York um, Times Book Review when um, I published my first collection of essays. It was called Prepared for the Worst. And um, in the London Times uh, literary supplement, it was reviewed by Conor Cruz O'Brien, who was the subject of a very critical chapter, or, or one of the essays uh, so collected, in other words. And he gave it quite a, quite a tough review. Um, and including mentioning that he was mentioned in the book and including correcting me on what he thought were a couple of points of interpretation. And uh, this predecessor of Sam said, oh, that's absolutely terrible. You must feel ghastly. I mean, how can they do that to you? They, they, uh, they take a book of yours and they give it to someone who's criticized in the book. I mean, that would, that would never happen here. And I said, well, no, that's why in some ways the TLS is a more, this was a long time ago, I guess, uh, the TLS is somewhat more readable than the New York Times Book Review, because it doesn't have this permanent affectation of integrity, where, where, <laughs> where there, there is an unspoken rule that all books by and about Henry Kissinger are always given respectful treatment, and usually by people who owe him something or could be reasonably expected to be in his debt. With everyone else, the degrees of separation, the, the, the absurd uh, degree and scope that um, Carlin was just adumbrating, almost prevent anyone who's qualified in the book or could be bothered to read it or be interested in the subject or the author from having anything to do with it. And that used to show, I thought, quite a lot. Now, there are, oh, there are very obvious things, I think, that you can do by way of a little diagram. Um, I think it was Spy Magazine used to actually do it. You could, you could show how some enemy of Philip Roth's or friend and so on, and, and how the cross hatchings of the blurbs went and all this kind of thing. And it's pretty easy to see that coming and, and, I, th and I think to fend it off. But um, I, I have just, it isn't, it isn't published yet, but I've just reviewed um, a novel by Ian McEwan 
for a, a novella called Chesil Beach, which he's here to launch. I hope you'll go to whatever event he's having at this expo. Who I've known for quite a long time, whose work, whose work I'm extremely and intimately familiar, um, an author who I asked to be the, the dedicatee of my new book, God is Not Great. It's consecrated to Ian McEwan. So I didn't ask him for a blurb, but I, I wish I had now. Um, and I consider myself the best person qualified to review on Chesil Beach for the Atlantic Monthly. And if anyone doesn't like that, they can kiss my ass. <laughs> And I don't believe anyone would say there was a quid pro quo involved. I think it would be just unbearably boring and cheap to say that. But if anyone wants to give it a try, bring it on, OK? <laughs> and remember the, the Job citation. You'll need it. You'll need it one day. <laughs> um. Let's make a couple of distinctions. If you are if you are new in the game or you know, struggling as a freelance reviewer, uh, you don't have any choice as to which books you're going to review. An editor will determine that. Uh, uh, the ethics, ethical question then becomes the editor's ethical question. I've been on both sides of this. Um, I've been a literary editor of the Times Book Review in the 70s and of The Nation. Uh, in the late um, 90s, and um, two entirely different operations, two entirely different philosophies have to apply. Uh, uh, as, as Sam can tell you at, uh, at greater and, and more intimate length, um, uh, when you are a magazine like the Times Book Review, charged basically with looking at everything that moves in the literary culture, uh, you will ha you, any individual book can get about seven different approaches to a review. Uh, it can, uh, no matter what the book is, you can, you can assign a reviewer whose approach will be autobiographical because they've gone through some of these experiences themselves, it will be journalistic because they have covered this kind of territory as a story, uh, can be uh, philosophical or intellectual <coughs> because they are philosophers on the question. Uh, it, it, it can, and, and, and the person that you assign at that moment will probably be somebody who will give you a different approach than the last time you wrote a, you had a, ran a review on this subject or ran a review of this author because you want to mix up your coverage. You want to be different from what you were last week. You don't always want to be predictable. So it's the, it, this is not vagrant. This is a necessary part of, of, of the froth of cultural journalism. Uh, uh, with, the, with the nation, um, uh, I had every expectation of, of when I sent out a book for review of getting a review that I agreed with. Uh, I, it, was, it was sent out, uh, many books we wouldn't review because they had no political context. Uh, uh, many books were reviewed uh, because I cared about them personally and I didn't care whether the rest of the culture did. Uh, it was my job, my, my, my playpen. Uh, uh, I did expect uh, to get back a, a, uh, within, a, within a framework somewhere uh, between, say, um, uh, I hate I hate to define the Democratic Party on the right as 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 Bill Clinton, but let's say that let's let's say from Bill Clinton all the way over to Che Guevara. Uh, but I didn't I, I would not be running uh, somebody to the right of Bill Clinton. Uh, I wouldn't ask him. Uh, and uh, this was a political magazine. You know, it had a right to be intemperate. It had a right to be biased. It had a right to, to, to try to control it. And you still can't control it because reviewers never do what you tell them to do. Uh, uh, so th those are the, those are the, on, the, on the literary side, uh, on, on the, I mean, on the editor side, on the, on the, on the, um, the writer's side, uh, I'm an old man now. I'm 68 years old. Uh, nobody can tell me what to do. Uh, I review only those books I want to review. Uh, and if I want to review at length, I shop around until somebody will let me review at length. Uh, otherwise, I review in Harper's. Uh, <laughs> uh, years ago, uh, 40 years ago, um, I, I wrote an article for a lapsed magazine called Cultural Affairs, uh, which, in which I interviewed myself as a daily book critic for the New York Times, <laughs> listing the questions that most often come up about the job. And the first question was, what do you do when a friend writes a book? And my answer then was, try to give it a favorable review. If you, if, if you don't like the way his mind works, uh, why is he your friend? 
Well, this was <laughs> this was a little jejun, uh, uh, but but sort of like Christopher, I will I will say the the same thing. Uh, who else am I supposed to be friends with? I've been in this business for 40 years. Uh, journalists, academics, and novelists are the people I become friends with because they're the only people I can go to dinner with who won't talk about movies or real estate. <laughs> they will talk about things I care about. Uh, so they become my friends. So, and, they st and, and many of them will stay my friends and a lot of them won't because if their books come along and if they write a book that I don't like, I used to review it. Uh, but I review it all the time, two or three times a week. Uh, now, if a friend writes a book that I don't like, I don't review it. They know that. And some of them resent it. But on the other hand, I, I became friends, or, or more, more what Toni Morrison says, a friend of the mind. There are a whole bunch of writers out there that I've reviewed most of their books over the years. I've never met them, or I met them once or twice at a cocktail party here or there. But I will always review their books because they were a friend of my mind right at the beginning. Uh, and I'm interested in how they work it out. And I don't, you know, and one book to the next, maybe, I'm not in the business of giving a grade. I'm not a grammar school teacher. And I'll say, this one's a B, that was a D plus, and, and this one's an A at last. Or, uh, I'm interested in, in the development, the evolution of this writer. I will always be interested in this writer. This writer, I, I, this is the writer I care about. Uh, so I will, I will review those, those people no matter how intimate I am with them. And I think it's a mistake, just as Christopher suggested, it's a mistake not to have me review these. Who knows them better? I've read every word. You know, I pride myself when I, re when I, when I review a, a writer to have read all of the books uh, and, to, and to try to see what that writer has been up to all of the time. And I mess up because I'm not as smart as... You know, I, you know, I review writers like Richard Powers, and I'm not as smart as Richard Powers, but I do my best. And frankly, I think ethics, uh, ethics questions when it comes to book reviews are such small potatoes when it comes to the corruptions of the, of the culture at large. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, the way metastatic capitalism lies to us, you know, the way everybody lies to us, and, the, and, and a poor book reviews, there's no money in it to begin with. Uh, and, and, and therefore, you can't have serious ethical questions. Uh, there are problems that we'll address, and I'll stop, but the problems we ought to address that, you know, the, there, there are, I consider it unethical for a book reviewer to be showing off at the expense of the author and the expense of the reader. I consider performance art book reviewing uh, a, a scandal. Uh, you've got your, your responsibilities are elsewhere, and if all you're doing is making, making a spectacle of yourself so that people will look at you, join the circus. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I also consider uh, the people who, who, who read out whole kinds of books because they don't like them. If, you're, if you care about literary fiction, you can't care about mysteries, you can't care about uh, cyberpunk science fiction, you can't care about this or that. Uh, these people are unimaginative, narrow, <laughs> parochial, uh, and we should pay no attention to them. And I think we should also worry about people uh, uh, who, bring, who bring to book reviewing uh, any kind of ideology. I'm a left winger. I've always been a left winger. Uh, but you know, if 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 I can't review Nabokov and like it, what's the matter with me? I'm a I'm an idiot as well as a left winger, uh, and uh, and I don't feel that that is necessary. But there are people who who, who make books uh, 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 submit to a litmus test, uh, and I think that is unethical. Uh, uh, but as for, I'll, I'll end with we're going back to the question of friends. Um, um, many of mine have lately been dying. And the fact that I could say something nice about them in public while they were still alive makes me think I have a chance to get into heaven, too. I'm going to answer two of Carlin's questions briefly and then go on to say why I don't want to answer any of the others. <laughs> um, first of all, I do send back books that I don't like, uh, mainly because I think, why should I ruin the life of an innocent first novelist when there are clearly, to me, people out there who will love this book and should be helped to find this book, which is one of the functions of the book review. Second of all, I also review book by, books by acquaintances and, and even friends. As Christopher said, it, I don't feel that it clouds my objectivity. As John said, I feel that I can be an advocate for the book. Years ago, um, I was assigned 
a book by one of, by one of Sam's predecessors at the book review. And it was someone I knew, a, a guy I knew, he wasn't a close friend, he was someone I taught with and had been at writers' conferences with. And I explained, I asked if that was a conflict of interest and the editor said, have you ever had an affair with the guy? <laughs> and I said, not that I remember. <laughs> and, and he said, fine, go ahead and, and uh, write the review. And I did. Uh, but, but the reason that, I, that the whole question of ethics kind of bothers me is it seems to me to support a slightly bogus idea about book reviewing, which is, uh, I think, not a friend of book reviewing in general, not a friend of literary culture, which is that the book review is some sort of version of consumer reports. Or it's you know like a peer review panel of the FDA. Uh, those are scientific processes, and the consequences are are grievous. That is, uh, you know, if you run the car into the wall and all the crash test dummies come flying off, uh, the car is dangerous. If you give a drug to someone and they all die, etc. But but book reviewing is quite a different matter because matters of opinion, matters of of taste all come in and should come in and don't have no relation finally to whether you know the writer or whether you've written this kind of book or so forth and and they're important and um, it seems to me that the primary obligation of the book reviewer is to write interestingly about the book uh, that that's whether you like the book whether you not like whether you don't like the book that should be uh, your idea I mean if you, if what's interesting to you and and also I think that if critics thought about that there would be a different kind of criticism. I mean, that is, um, if what's interesting to a critic is to set up a book, you know, like a beer can in one's backyard and just shoot at it, then that's sort of interesting. That's interesting to a critic. It doesn't happen to be interesting to me at this point in my life. Um, and I think that the most unethical thing to do is to write about a book boringly. It's no friend to the book. It's no, you're being no friend to the writer and no friend to reading in general, which is what we all should be doing. Thanks. Um, I agree with just about everything uh, the panelists have said so far. First, though, I want to say I hope that we at the Book Review have rid ourselves of the stigma of the permanent affectation of integrity. Um, we also um, want to be interesting. What we look at first is the reader. Um, something that occurs to me, um, or occurred to me when Carlin read through those list of questions is it all seemed to be about a transaction between the reviewer and the author, reviewer and the publisher, when everyone here has said, um, as a critic oneself, and I've written probably far too much criticism um, from my own good and everyone else's, are you really thinking of the reader? I mean, you're, you're seeing it as a, you know, not certainly not performance art, but a kind of narrative that will engage the reader's interest. And I think when we talk a lot about the ethics of reviewing, we are covertly and sometimes overtly degrading the principles of criticism. And I, th th my predecessors have said that much better um, than I can, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, a couple of other questions that have come up. Uh, we have a review running this Sunday. Forgive me if I've got the dates wrong. We close so early, I never know. What's coming up for me, in my mind, for next Sunday is often two or three weeks ahead. I think it's this Sunday. Is Jonathan Lethem on Ian McEwan's new novel? And um, when I approached him, we put him through the New York Times ringer about ethics, and he said, uh, which is conflict again. And he said, well, you know, I did once have a comradely lunch or dinner with Ian McEwen, but I think I can write about him well. And he wrote what I think is one of the really superb essays we've published for just the reasons Christopher um, has mentioned, it, and, and John and Francine as well, because he grasps the, the meaning of the work at its root. He's a fellow novelist who also has a kind of theoretical idea about what fiction can and, and can't do. He understands him uh, with the respect that a major practitioner in the same field has, but someone who's also read very widely and deeply in literature. He's a gorgeous writer himself. Who gains if Latham doesn't write that review? Who profits from it? Maybe we could huddle somewhere in a room, that is my colleagues and I, 
and say, well, we dodged that bullet. But it wasn't a bullet. It was a gift that was denied our readers. A couple of other examples. Uh, we early on, I started the job just a little over three years ago. Uh, Jonathan Franzen sent us a note. And he said, um, look, I want to write something about Alice Munro. I think this is one of the great living writers. And that's what I'm going to say. So I thought, well, now, do you not want to hear what Jonathan Franzen has to say about Alice Munro? I wanted to see what he had to say. And I think it's one of the great and really influential pieces we've published. A more recent example, we had Christopher's book, God is Not Great. And Christopher, did I hear you say God bless to someone when we walked in? Or is that you Too did? <laughs> and, um, and we decided, we asked ourselves, who would be interesting on this? And Mike Kinsley seemed like a guy who would write about it in an intelligent, lively way, partly because he does know Christopher. And so in the note I sent him, I said, we, I assume you two were acquainted. Let's make that clear somehow in the review and take it on its own terms. And um, I didn't hear many complaints about that review. There were objections that uh, Mike also uh, is an atheist, but it seemed to us at this point with so many books being written on the topic and uh, so few with the panache and wit of Christopher's, you want a critic who has the same panache and wit. You want a, a kind of a duel of, of interesting minds. And so it's a review we're very happy to have done. And uh, the last thing I'll say is um, not long into this job I now hold, uh, one of my esteemed colleagues, Julie Just, said, you'll know who your friends are when you leave this job. And I said, that's not a problem. I don't have any friends anyway. <laughs> So I'm just realizing sitting up here that I'm faint with hunger. So if, <clears throat> if this is non-coherent, I apologize. Um, as far as the survey, you know, I could run through the questions and say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Um, but I also think that this issue of ethics is probably overstated or maybe we're not looking at it from the right filter. From my point of view as an editor, um, it boils down to a kind of case-by-case -case basis. I don't have very many hard and fast rules. The, the primary one in terms of the reviewers that I work with is disclose to me first. Um, I mean, we also put reviewers through a, we ask them about um, potential conflicts. And I've had people say, you know, as far as, and I say no potential conflict is too stupid. Um, so I've had people say, I don't know if I can review a book, a certain novel that Knopf published because Knopf turned down my last novel. <laughs> And I, you know, I say, fine, that doesn't bother me, unless it bothers you. I mean, for me, the real issue is, can the reviewer write, and, and well, I don't really believe in objectivity as a concept, so that's the wrong way, but a kind of, uh, as objective as it can get, can the reviewer take the book on, on its own terms, and create a review that I agree with uh, what Francine was saying, that needs to be a reading experience, a discreet and wonderful reading experience on its own, that needs to be part of a three-dimensional conversation between the reviewer, the writer of the book under review, and the reader of the review. I think that's a very important point, that it, it, it's not just about the reviewer on the book, but there is a third party in this, and I think that third party is, in many ways, the most important party. Um, and does the reviewer have something to say that is compelling and interesting and informative of, and, and real about what this book is, what this book does? And, you know, and I think that those questions are not, they don't break down to a survey for me. They're a really individual case-by-case -case, um, situation. So for instance, if you are signing a review of Don DeLillo, it matters, in my view, that the reviewer is familiar with DeLillo's career. It doesn't necessarily matter whether the reviewer has been sympathetic entirely or not, but the reviewer has to know something about DeLillo. It's a lot different than if you were assigning a review of a first novel or even of a third novel by a writer where the novel sort of stands on its own in terms of the review. I also think it's different if you're assigning a longer review or a shorter review. If you're assigning an essay-ish essay review, then you, the assumption, or at least my assumption, is that there will be more career context, more of a sense of placing this writer within a frame, whereas in a six or an 800-word review, it's often all a reviewer can do to basically assess the book. 
um, of the book under question. So I want my reviewers to tell me any potential conflict, and then I'll decide case by case. I have, I do draw the line um, at having friends review friends, because I think it gets tricky, um, and it's a tricky area I'd rather not go into. I don't, I don't review my friends' books as a reviewer, um, mostly because I want them to remain my friends. Um, <laughs> And also, I just feel like it's cleaner not to, ha not to have that. But as far as acquaintances go, it, it, again, it depends on the nature of the acquaintance. If it's somebody you, you, know, you interviewed 10 years ago, does that invalidate you from writing a review? I don't think so, unless it's someone you had a strong reaction to. I was giving an example. I won't say who it is, but I was giving an example of a, a writer. I wanted to review a book, and then I interviewed this writer. And I also don't necessarily have a problem with a reviewer who does an interview with a writer and then also reviews the book. Again, it depends on whether that reviewer can maintain his sort of critical distance or critical judgment. But I wanted to review this book, and I interviewed the writer, and I detested the writer so much after spending an hour interviewing him that I couldn't review the book because I couldn't, I couldn't keep that out. So I opted out of reviewing that book. That was before I was an editor. So those things happen. I don't have an issue with, re with reviewers saying to me, I don't want to review this book, or I've read part of this book, and I don't want to review it, although I also think that it's the ethical obligation of the book review to publish negative reviews. Um, I think I don't trust a critical voice, whether, in it, whether it's a, a critic's voice or a publication's voice, that isn't willing to be negative. But that said, I also don't trust a publication or a critic that, you know, that where the negativity is gratuitous. I think what Christopher was saying is really important, that even though he wanted to give that book a bad review, he couldn't because he liked the book. He thought the book was remarkable. And I think that, to me, is the ultimate um, ethical standard. Can you praise the book even though you don't want to? Or can you criticize the book or take it on even though you don't want to? And that, to me, is the real standard. Um, and I could talk more specifically, but I'll, I'll stop there. Um, again, I, I just want to stress the idea that it really, to me, is very much a kind of case-by-case -case sort of situation, depending on uh, the book under review, um, the review, and the editor. Oh, and the other thing I'll just say, one, one other thing I'll say is I also think it's the, it's the role of the book review to occasionally challenge, I'm uh, not challenge, champion writers. So for instance, last Sunday, um, we put Lydia Davis on the cover because I think Lydia Davis is a remarkable short story writer who has never gotten her due. And so I wanted, to put, I wanted to put that book on the cover and give it more play. We gave it a long review. We had, um, again, we, create, we sort of assigned a career piece using the new collection as a way of looking at the career of this writer, as a way of, of fulfilling what I think is one of the functions of a, book, of a newspaper book review, which is to say to our readers, here, you ought to be paying attention to this. Um, and that, too, I think is something that is ethical in a different way because we all are part of this conversation about books and literature and I think we need to be cognizant of that and what it means both in terms of criticizing books and also in terms of championing them. Thanks. I, I am not the designated defender of this survey. I agree with a lot of what's been and said, and I have a mixed view on a lot of these things, but I'm going to punch back a little bit from the standpoint of ethics mattering, because I heard some things that suggested that they do matter after you get past the original you know, uh, pronouncement that um, it's okay to do this and that. Let's talk about Ian McEwen as an example, um, since he's come up several times. So today in the Times is a really nasty review of his new novel that says it's a lousy book by, by Kakutani. Now, I thought it was a terrible review, as I think a lot of her reviews are terrible reviews. In other words, every, every sentence she quoted from McEwen was a better sentence than any sentence she wrote herself <laughs> in the review. Um, so it's not well argued, it's not convincing, and so on, full of adjectives, you know. Um, but I don't think she was thinking, well, I'm not sure I should say this. Um, he's a nice guy, I met him at lunch, and so on. And one of my concerns when I've assigned and as a reviewer and so on is, can you write an honest review? Can you be honestly negative? That's usually the challenging question if you don't like a book. So, I mean, Christopher, if you read Ian's book and you actually shared Kakutani's opinion. Could you say it? Would you say it? And when you talk about the reader, who loses in this, who gains? It seems to me readers do lose 
when you get phony reviews from friends that say this is a great novel when s secretly you're thinking, boy, this was really disappointing, but I can't say that about him. So I'm just wondering what you all think about you know, the, the real ability to be honest uh, in a negative vein when there is some kind of connection and you do care about friendship. Well, if I, I think if I was sent um, a novel by Ian McEwan and really disliked it, I probably would decide not to review it. I think I, I just have to, I wouldn't be able to say, if I really disliked it, I knew I wouldn't be able to say how much I did, put it like that. Um, I did give an even dearer friend of mine, Martin Amis, an extremely nasty review once, but that was because there was so much unpleasant stuff about me in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like he earned it. That review was obviously vetted before yeah, he, he it was had a bad review coming for that one. Huh? Uh, I, want to, I want to say something about that. It's very simple not to review a book. You don't have to review every book that comes along, even if it's by your friend uh, or your acquaintance or whatever. Uh, it, yes, you, for, for, for uh, intellectual respectability, any publication and any critic has got to have a record of... of, of uh, of negative reviews, if only so that the reader has a way to bounce, uh, to, to judge, to shade. Uh, uh, you've got to establish your reputation. The more you review, the easier this is uh, for what you like and dislike, uh, what your standards are, uh, so that you don't have to start all over again with every review, every 800 review, 800 word review saying, this is what I care about, this is what I don't care about, so you know where I am. You, but you, 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 so a negative review can help, can help you uh, establish in the reader's mind where you stand in the culture. This is this is fine, but at a certain point, you you cease to be, or you should cease to be, uh, making your reputation on the basis of scorch and uh, uh, slash and burn uh, reviewing. Uh, I, I no longer have the taste, unless it's in Norman Podhoritz. Uh, <laughs> I, I no longer really want to 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 tear somebody to shreds. Uh, and like Francine, uh, you know, a book will be, will be sent to me and, and I'll look at it and I don't like this and I don't see any reason to tell people, uh, you know, tell a whole bunch of people that here's a book by somebody you never heard of and it isn't any good. Uh, and uh, this, this seems to me to taste like aspirin. Uh, but but when, the, when the particular thing with the, with the friend comes along, you can't lie. You can't say it's a good book when it's not a good book. Your only honor is, is, is your name and your reputation. Uh, so, so keep silent or lose the friendship and write the, and write the excoriating review. One of the things we tend to forget is that, uh, is that reviews are written and reviewers exist in various emotional clouds. Uh, when we're reviewing a book, we may be infirm. We may be uh, divorcing. Uh, we may be drunk. Uh, 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 we, you know, we we may be so full of hatred for the for the world for reasons that are that are that, that can't be explained, or just depressed. Uh, and the in comes a book, and we're not being fair to it. We've got to we've got to always consult our own weather before we send those words out. Uh, and uh, there was a, there was a time in my life when I was basically killing myself with alcohol, uh, and I was finding in every book that was sent to me for review reveries of the sort that fit right in with the reveries that I was, that I was indulging in. Um, and uh, this often had nothing really to do with the book itself or what the author intended. It had to do with what I thought I needed and my self-pity and everything. And after looking at a couple of these things when they were published, I decided to give books a rest for a while because they were more important uh, th uh, than, th for, than to be used in such a, in such a way. Uh, and so I just stopped, and, and then I sobered up, and then I felt I could at least, you know, you think against yourself as a reviewer. You, you say, okay, what are my preconceptions here that may interfere? Uh, and, and once you've gone that, the, the next part of the process is, is to say, okay, if I really like this book or I think the argument is important, how can I get the reader to see this? And that becomes your act of craft. That becomes the interesting thing that, that, that Francine demands of a review. Uh, uh, okay, the, you, you mount an argument. It's an act of seduction. 
uh, and, but you want somehow to recreate in the reader the, the, the experiences that you had when you read the book. Uh, and and you know, so friends, acquaintances, enemies uh, don't have nearly as much to do with it or ought, ought to have nearly as much to do with it as your honest encounter with that book at that time to the best of your ability to report to the reader what happened to you when you were lost in it. Uh, for years, I wrote reviews for the New York Observer, and my editor there was the wonderful Adam Begley, who knew that he could send me books that would really irritate me for <laughs> extra literary reasons, and that I would go kind of nuts and just write these trashing, hilarious reviews. And, you know, books about the life-saving wonders of plastic surgery and so forth that I would just, you know, and, and nothing is more fun, I mean, I have to say, than writing that kind of review, because often you can use these books to mock themselves. All you have to do is quote. But... But finally, it just began to seem sort of sickening to me, and, and I couldn't do it anymore. I mean, there are many ways of writing a negative review. Every so often, you really feel you have to have one, have to write one. I just reviewed for the Times the new Jim Crace novel, a book I didn't particularly like, but I think he's a wonderful writer. And there's a way of saying that and doing that without just wanting, for some strange reason, to destroy the writer, destroy the book, and destroy the person's career. Oh, there's a wonderful um, some advice from Evelyn War about this. Um, when you want to praise faintly, for example. You know, if it's Hollywood, you, you probably know this, someone's done a ghastly film and you say, you must be very proud. <laughs> or, or the other thing is you say, oh, you've done it again. <laughs> um, with, with book reviewing, it has to be a little more subtle than that. Even War suggests that you say, oh, Mr. Crace's many admirers will uh, find much to like in this book. <laughs> You know, that would really sting if someone said that about me. <laughs> Does it, I, I, I don't know if any of the uh, review editors want to speak to this, but it seems to me one reality of the business is that when people do turn, bound, turn back books uh, because they don't want to say something negative, often they don't get reassigned. And you know that old notion that any publicity is good publicity, any coverage is worthwhile coverage. Uh, th does that bother anybody that if you turn down a, a book, maybe that book by the first time novelist won't get a review? Yeah, I uh, I sent back the historian that book, mm -hmm. and because uh, I thought it was the worst thing that it, I had ever read in my entire life, and it became a mega bestseller. So I don't. It doesn't seem to me that I did that much harm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it. I, I think it depends on the book. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for a variety of reasons. One is that you know these things are time sensitive, especially in newspapers, and um, so I, I think sometimes that small first novel might not get reassigned. Um, you know, if it's a case where, you know, as an example, we had, um, it wasn't because of the book, it wasn't because the book wasn't liked, but for instance, we have a review, had a review assigned of Tom Segev's book, 1967, and then there was a, the reviewer, um, there was an issue and wasn't able to review the book, so we had to reassign the book, but as a consequence, we'll be a little late on that, later than we would have liked on that review. Um, so sometimes that happens. I think it's all, but I think, you know, the other sort of unspoken part of this, and this panel isn't about this, so we'll stay off of the subject, is that for most book review <coughs> sections, newspaper book review sections, space is always at a premium anyway. So you're always, it's always sort of a kind of um, triage situation where you're trying to recover what you can, and n you know that there are always going to be many worthy books that aren't going to get covered that you'd very much like to cover, but there's just simply no way to do it. Um, because you do, you, you're always fighting to balance how many books you can cover with what's the depth of the coverage you're going to give them, and, um, and I think that that's a really sort of important balance to keep in mind. It's not just merely about the quantity of books, but also about the quality of criticism. Uh, uh, I'm going to open this up to, to the audience as we move into that last half hour where people can choose to stay or not. Um, I did want to say that this, though. I mean, all five of our panelists are authors, have been authors, and our critical community in the NBCC split on that question of turning back books. It was actually one of the few exact splits, 34%, 34%, you should always do it negative or positive, or no, it's okay not to do a negative review. I find it interesting that probably everybody on this panel thinks you can say whatever you want to say, however nasty it might be about government officials, business officials, po politicians, and so on, but there's a kind of desire that we be kindly to authors. 
um, and not really always call a spade a spade. I mean, I want to say something for the, for the critical side. I don't understand why it's not okay to look at a book and say this is really terrible and maybe even in stinging language when it's okay to criticize almost every other part of society. Now, one thing that does happen to all of us at newspapers, I think, and I'll make this my last question before opening it up, is that some of us find ourselves working for institutions that have rules of ethics we don't necessarily share, that don't make sense to us. When I came in, I remember Mike Levitas was the Times book editor. I remember him telling me, no one can ever request a book for review at the Times. It's absolutely prohibited. We decide who reviews a book. And as you see, that was a question on the survey. Uh, can the people who have been in that situation speak to, how do you handle that? You don't really agree with the code of ethics of the New York Times or the LA Times as it applies to book reviewing, but it's there. Yeah, I'd like to give you. I, I, I want to say, I Carlin, let's let's go to the let's go back to this business of uh, of being kinder to authors than we are to to politicians, to businessmen, uh, or whatever. Uh, there is a there's a difference in kind and a difference in quality between the people who have power and the people who don't. And some innocent person who's published even a bad book has no power to wound the culture, to wound you, to wound anybody else. Uh, and, but, but somebody who is, who is in government, uh, somebody who, is, who runs a big business, somebody who owns a newspaper, somebody, somebody like that, has a lot of power in the community, and you, you have to speak to them, you have to say that they are lying, you have to make sure they don't get away with anything, because these people run the world. The first novelist does not run the world. Uh, uh, I think you are obliged at a certain point, if it's, a, if, 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 if it's a Philip Roth or whatever, somewhere along the line, you say, this, I didn't like this book, I didn't like that book or whatever. Uh, but that's a reputation. He's, he's, he's established. He's, he's not vulnerable. He's not out there without a shell on. He's not somebody who, who spent all those years uh, you know, writing a book and then sending it naked out into the world, having, having been antisocial all that time. And this is his child, and you stomp on it. You know, so what? Big you. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> these people, these people do not deserve the rudeness of a culture that that is tended to rudeness anyway. I, can, I just want to jump in on this on this one point. Um, at the risk of sounding like the hard ass on the panel, I don't, I don't, I hope I didn't give the impression that I think we should be nice to writers of books that don't merit niceness. Um, and I think that. It's important, again, it comes back to the importance of, of negative reviews, not because it's important to be negative, but because it's important to tell the truth about what you think about a book. Um, I think that's true from a writer's point of view. I think that's true from an editorial point of view. Um, what I draw the line at is I don't want to, I don't think it's ethical to write or publish a hit piece, but I do think it's ethical to write and publish negative reviews, even negative reviews of writers early in their career, if that's the review that you get. And I do think it's essential in terms of the readers, again, trusting the publication that we assign books to reviewers who will say what they think and who will wear their enthusiasms pro or their enthusiasms or their anti-enthusiasms on their sleeve and won't pull their punches. I mean, this is something that I say all the time to people, don't pull your punches. And I think, but I also think people review, sometimes reviewers tend to pull their punches in terms of positive criticism as well. They feel that it's somehow anti-intellectual to be effusive um, or to be emotional. And I think that book reviewing, again, in terms of what Francine was saying, in terms of the shapely essay notion of book reviewing, it, re it relies on the kind of, on the engagement and enthusiasm pro or con of the critic. That's what I'm looking for more than, in, more than I'm looking for a, a positive or a negative review. <clears throat> um, gosh, is there anything to add? Uh, well, first of all, sure, we published some very, very tough reviews. Um, and we do it when we think they're good. Um, that is to say that uh, the argument seems to stand up to scrutiny, and the writing is good. It doesn't mean we agree with them, uh, but we publish them. And reviewers, of course, should not feel constrained in what they say or how they say it. Also, as far as uh, books being turned back and going out to um, other reviewers, uh, we reassign whenever we can. You know, um, something that I think we're, some of us are obliquely getting at, maybe two points. One is there's very different ways in which one can review. I speak as much as a reviewer, as a book review editor. Fiction versus nonfiction. Um, 
because nonfiction, you can kind of write about the subject and engage with it that way. Um, this is one reason um, that the, and this is sort of the corollary point, that the authors who most often get slighted in the sense of not being reviewed uh, because we think we're sparing them our first novelists or authors of their first short story collections. And if you know how uh, the section I edit works, we have, a, a f by book reviewing standards, by the standards of contemporary journalism, a fairly large staff of six or eight people, sometimes one or two more, who are actually reading fairly deeply into the galley before deciding whether to assign it. And they tend to be pretty tough. Our reviewers tend to be tougher. And we think, here is a first novelist. Here's a novel that seems like there's some promise here. Um, but what happens when it gets hammered? And this is what John is talking about. You have really nobody from nowhere who's worked very hard and written a book whose only claim to very small celebrity will be that someone eviscerated it in the pages of the New York Times book review. We would rather not do that. Now, to the credit of our readers, and I don't know how, what experience other people have had here. I've had it both as, as an author and as a book review writer. Readers often read criticism very differently from the way we inside the business do. For one thing, they tend to think almost any book review is favorable simply because the book is being reviewed and the author's name is endlessly repeated. I remember when a book of mine came out and it was, it was well reviewed but there were some uh, dissenting voices and I was shocked to hear myself complimented on those favorable reviews. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe readers know something we don't, which is not only that it's not essential to be parsing every phrase in a review because the fact is most of us are sort of grub streeters still. That is to say we're not writing Dr. Johnson or Coleridge's prose, though we, you know, we'd like to. Um, but also that readers know a review is one person's opinion and the bylines we talk about and that we covet at my section, I'm sure David does too. We got X to review Y. Most readers don't even notice, unless it's a huge name. They really don't notice. They notice that the Times book review reviewed something. And in fact, publishers know this too. Because one will often see ads that quote from the New York Times book review. It'll be a, a line of praise. It will say New York Times book review. And it won't say the reviewer with someone who seems hugely consequential to us. It's because most readers don't look at it that way. And I say more power to them. You know, here we live in what Roth calls the ego sphere. And each one of us carries his own uh, with him or her. Um, I think readers in their way know better. And um, so that's good. <laughs> I think it, it also keeps us from taking ourselves too seriously. A couple of our panelists have to go. It's a little bit past 12.30. Um, some of them can stay. I'm sure some of you can stay. Let's take a little break for just a minute. Uh, anybody who needs to go, please go. And then the rest of us can keep talking. And I want to open up to questions, conversation from the audience. So, so and we have a microphone in, in the audience. So uh, please say who you are and direct your questions to somebody in, p in particular. And our first question is. Hi, um, my name is Lizzie Skernick and I'm a freelance reviewer. And I'm glad the three of you are left on the panel because I think you had the most interesting things to say about this topic. But well, I was interested on the question of reviewing one's friends and enemies because it seems like the reader actually has a very different perspective than what the three of you as reviewers would say. And that I think your average reader, the worry uh, when a friend or enemy is reviewed, obviously, is the question of influence. But it seems like what you're saying and what we saw in um, Christopher Hitchens' story is that it's not a question of not seeing the book clearly. 
it's a question of whether or not you might want to publish the review. Uh, it seemed like what Christopher was saying was not that he couldn't see the book of his enemy clearly, but that he was galled by the fact that he liked the book. Uh, is that the case? Do you really think there's no question of actual influence? And if there is a question of influence, um, is that a bad thing? Can I answer that? Well, first of all, I just have to say that I don't really understand what clearly means in this situation. I mean, because there's so many, to, to, to make it a question of whether you know the reviewer, whether you know the author, and there's so many other factors. I mean, the two, for example, the two most positive reviews that I've written recently for the Times Book Review. One was a book that I read while I was waiting I, in a doctor's office, you know, endless waits for, I'd broken my arm. And the other was a book that I'd read on a transatlantic airplane flight. Now those are situations in which I'm grateful for distraction. I have no, you know, I'll pr pretty much love what, I, and in fact, I love those books. I mean, I've since looked at the books. I was right to love them. But when the assigning editor called me, should I have said, you know where I read those books? I was in a doctor's office and an airplane flight. I mean, so much influences one's judgment that the question of, of our acquaintance with the writer is only a little tiny percentage of that. So, so I, again, the whole question of objectivity seems odd to me because it's, a, it's opinion. It's finally, it's just one's taste, one's mood, one's, as John said, one's moment in life. All those things factor in. Other question? Yeah, back there. Hi, um, I'm Levi Asher, here as a blogger. Um, favoritism is only one ethical issue. Um, one, I actually had hoped to direct this to, to Sam Tannenhaus. I remember um, when Henry Kissinger reviewed a book um, about Dean Atchison, and um, you know, I, I think I was not alone in feeling it was a sort of thinly veiled defense of his own career as Secretary of State. And you know, is that a, another form, uh, this self-serving review, um, is, is that another form of ethical consideration? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that gets back to what John was saying about performance art reviewing. And I think that's not just true in the case of someone like Kissinger. It also has to do with any reviewer who has an axe to grind that's not generated by the book under review. You know, I mean, maybe the book under review gives you an axe to grind, pro or con, but, it, but, not, um, but I don't, I, I'm not interested in the reviewer who comes in with a soapbox and then stands on it and uses the book as an excuse to wax philosophical or otherwise about a variety of subjects. You know, you have to you have to do do think this way though. If you're if you're um, if you're a journalistic enterprise such as the Times Book Review, uh, uh, you want to raise some eyebrows, stir some crap, uh, do all of this and that. Uh, uh, every once in a while, it seems to me to be journalistically justifiable to throw something like this out. I'm not going to pick up Henry Kissinger and say, oh boy, Henry Kissinger, I really want to know what he thinks about whatever it is. He's, you know, I know what he thinks, and he thinks only about Henry Kissinger. Uh, in fact, I, I, I left the New York Times back in 1983 after uh, uh, when I was the Daily Book Critic because um, uh, they'd started vetting my, my, uh, my newspaper reviews uh, politically. Uh, and. Uh, a particular example was Henry Kissinger's memoirs. Uh, it, it, they held it for a week. It all went to went to every editor in the in the in the place, and I basically just you know he said, and I, I have to say this. This is off the subject, but Henry Kissinger, in his first volume of memoirs, wrote that he'd spent one sleepless night in all his years in public service, and that was the evening before his secret visit to China when he, they were opening up the channel to China. And, and my crime, so far as the New York Times was concerned, was to suggest that he should have spent many more sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but, but, you know, Kissinger, uh, every, one, every once in a while you want to get, I mean, I remember my, back in my day, you get Eugene McCarthy. Well, you were going to get Eugene McCarthy being disdainful of everybody else, but you were going to get people to read it. And, and that was just showbiz. John, before we go to the next question, can you just explain what you mean by performance art criticism? Because I've always loved your reviewing, and I think of you as a performance art critic. I mean, of every 10 metaphors in one of your sentences, I think eight absolutely soar, and that's the highest percentage I know of, of, of anybody. Um, but do you, do you mean instead 
of telling people what the book are, is about and ex, and giving them your experience of the book, yeah, so the book I have, disappears. I or? have never, like you, and I, I read I read the reviews that that that, that show up on the online uh, that you write, Carlin. Uh, uh, about, you always make it a point to quote to quote the writer you're reviewing. Uh, you always make it a point. Uh, we we always try to sure we're, we're, the metaphors that that I use or you use should somehow come out of the metaphors that we've been exposed to by the book. You, you begin to think like the, like the, if you admire the writer, uh, like, like the writer, so that it's, it's suggestive. And they ought to be in the service of the, of the book. The, the best in the business ever for doing this was Isaiah Berlin, where you sometimes couldn't tell when he was writing about Hertzen or something like that, where Hertzen stopped and Berlin took over. This, this gives a kind of momentum to the to the, to the review and also persuasiveness to to the review. I'm not saying that you shouldn't write well when you write. When, I, I'm I'm saying that it should not be at the expense of the writer and the and the book that you're reviewing. That everybody sees only you, and not the, and and not the writer because because uh, quite frankly, it is a parasitic business reviewing. Without the genius, we are nothing. We are nothing, but we are riding that genius. We are symbiotic on, on it. Uh, and somebody had to do a lot of work so that we do less amount of work. And we, we find our honor in various ways, which we've discussed at this panel. Um, but let's not misunderstand uh, where the importance is, the, the, the importance uh, and the responsibility to the reader and to the writer is to make sure that we keep who's first first. Thanks. Yeah, we have a question in the back. Yeah, I yeah. first of all uh, want to know uh, about negative reviews. To me, as a reader, they're more enjoyable to read. My sense is that uh, they may sell more papers for you. Um, but on the flip side, what about the uh, the publishing uh, advertisers? What kind of pressure might you get for the reviews not to be quite so negative? So if you could talk to both those sides. Well, since publishers don't advertise in regional <laughs> book review sections, I feel absolutely no pressure whatsoever. Um, I, I wouldn't if they, uh, you know, I, I believe in the church state wall. I want it as high as possible. I don't talk to the advertising side. Um, I mean, not, I'm sure they're perfectly nice. But I wouldn't know, and I don't want to know. Um, it, so it's an irrelevant question. I think if you're thinking about advertising when you're assigning or editing reviews, then you should get another job. speak to that, anybody? Yeah. Or else we'll go to the next question. Uh, John in the back, and then maybe up here in the front. I had a question. Um, what happens when a hit piece is written, and you're not sure that it's a hit piece, and it runs, and the damage is done? Um, this is a question, basically, I guess, for John and for Carlin. Uh, I mean, sorry, David and Carlin um, and, and John. When something has happened, and, and you're not sure that, that it has an unethical dimension to it until it's run, um, and someone informs you, what, you know, there's a background to this. What do you do? Do you go and assign a new review, or um, what's what's the what's sort of the damage control? Uh, let me let me speak to this from 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 scars that glow in the dark after many many years. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about the one that, that before you published. I'm talking about the ones that you do publish. Uh, that it turns out that that you should have known better. Uh, uh, you have no choice. But to, but to fess up and in public and as quickly and as prominently as possible, uh, because you've re you've done real damage to your credibility, in in uh, in a particularly grievous instance in my in my tenure at the Times Book Review in the early 70s, uh, um, I got a telephone call from the lawyer, the, the hotshot lawyer many of you may remember if you're as old as I am, Melvin Belli. Uh, and Melvin Belli wanted to review a book that somebody, I can't remember the name of the author now, Charles something, had written on judges in America. And had written a, it was an attack on, on judges. And Melvin Belli suggested plausibly to me uh, that he had a lot of opinions on judges and that this book was a wonderful jumping off point for telling stories about judges, et cetera, et cetera. So I commissioned that. And uh, in came a review, which was quite entertaining. Uh, and, and favorable to the book under review, and I published it. Uh, and I then got a call from a reporter, I believe at the Philadelphia uh, Inquirer, uh, saying that, that he had heard that um, 
uh, that all of this was a joke, that, that, uh, that Belli was a friend of the author of this book, and that the author of the book had posed as Belli with Belli's permission and had conned me into getting his own book assigned to him, and he'd written the review himself. <laughs> and, I had, and I had published it. Uh, and I, uh, I said, good God. <laughs> uh, there's no way, I'm good at talking my way out of lots of things, but there was no way to talk my way out of that, and I made a few inquiries, and everybody thought it was very humorous, but me, I didn't think it was humorous. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, I devoted the back page of the Times Book Review, the following issue, to a column titled Suckered, <laughs> and, and described the whole thing, and, and said that, you know, that none of this is funny. None of it is, is funny. The, a whole bunch of people have been cheated so you could have your clubby yucks. Uh, and, uh, uh, and as a result, you know, everybody that seems to have been associated with this, all I can do is say they'll never, I'll never have anything to do with them again. Uh, but that's insufficient because, because everybody's been cheated. Uh, and uh, you know, when, you, when you find out, in the, if you find out in time, obviously you don't, you don't run it. But again, your, your, your recourse, we're not a, this is not, this is, I repeat again what I said at the very beginning, it's not life and death. Uh, it's not, it's, 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 you don't cut off people's hands because they behave badly in this. Uh, uh, you just say, I'll never use that person as a, as a reviewer again. I'll never trust that person. In my, in my tenure at the Times Book Review, you could never trust a poet. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, now it's coming out. <laughs> all poets, all poets had ulterior agendas. All poets had mixed motives. Poets would wait for decades to get somebody who'd stolen their girlfriend. You know, uh, you know, poets, the person who was the chairman of the department at the university was going to get it. Uh, you know, Christopher, Christopher holding a grudge. All poets behave badly. Uh, and I had to get out of town. I had to you know, hire Helen Vendler up in, up in Boston to basically vet every single book of poetry that came in because I, you know, I would trust her and I wouldn't trust anybody else. Uh, uh, to, to at least tell me where the bodies were buried. You never know where all the bodies are buried, but when you find out one is buried, you've got to make it clear. You've got to fess up, you've got, and you've got to apologize to everybody uh, as quickly as possible. See, John, now you're getting into the spirit of the survey. That's like a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I tell a quick case of mine a long time ago uh, where um, I assigned a review of a biography of Michener to somebody who had worked for him on one of his teams of researchers, and I thought I had vetted the guy and, you know, mm -hmm. that the, the relationship was fine and he knew about Michener and all that. And then it was a Friday and the our book section was ready to run and I learned that he had sued Michener and, and actually, you know, won money from Michener and he hadn't told me this and all of that. So luckily, in those days, we didn't have much advanced time, and I was able to put the Beans of Egypt, Maine, as I remember, by <laughs> Carolyn Shute, which would not have been a cover review yeah. on the cover. So, you know, that, that was, was savable. But um, the, the other thing that always sticks in my mind is setting up a review with, with a, actually a poet, a leading black poet, um, a good guy, liked him and all of that. We set it all up, ready to go, and I said to him, well, I guess we're in great shape unless you were married to her. And he said, I thought you knew that. <laughs> I said, no, how the hell am I going to know that? Am I tracking your sex life like every day or, you know? Um, and, but luckily we had time to back out of that. But this is why one of the best answers on this survey, which happened in our earlier survey too, was that both reviewer and editor should feel an obligation to raise a potential conflict of interest. Reviewers just shouldn't leave it to the editor because editors are too busy often to remember to ask and so on. Right, and I think that's the key point is that it's, it's a mutual obligation. Editors only know what reviewers are going to tell them. I mean, unless you know the reviewer really, really, really well, which only happens in, in, in a rare instance. So you can ask the question, but if you don't get the answer, you're at the mercy, but I agree just, you know, with everyone that if, if, if you get caught in that situation, you have no choice but to just come clean instantly. And, um, and I think in the case, if, if someone trashes a book out of nefarious purposes, um, probably to reassign the book. Yeah, you've been very patient in the first row there. Sorry about that riff. My name is Alicia Annabelle. I'm the host, writer, and co-editor of a podcast show called Latina Source. I edit a book, I, I review a book twice a month. And my, I'm looking for more advice on how to filter out. I had a conversation with a professor about a specific author who's an amazing Latina author. 
but I hated her book, and she's actually here today, and I'm probably going to end up meeting her, and I'm reviewing her book on the next show. How do you filter out, how do you, you know, filter out a lot of the voices in your head, you know, and, and stay objective, you know, and true to the book? You know, I, like I was having a lot of issues with the characters, but how much of that is what you're hearing from external voices and what's true to the author's words? Anybody? I don't know. I mean, I think I, it's hard to filter out, you know, suppose the character reminds you of somebody you know in your life and you despise. It's very hard to not, but, but, but I think finally your obligation is to try and figure out what the writer is trying to do and how well the writer has succeeded in whatever he or she is trying to do and that has nothing to do with the characters. And also, something in general I'd like to raise, which is one of the things that bothers me most about contemporary book reviewing and contemporary reading, which is this kind of nutty idea that, that if you don't like the characters in a book, you don't like the book. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, uh, how would you read Crime and Punishment, for example? <laughs> I mean, you know, the guy kills two old ladies for no reason. Um, so I think that that has to be filtered out, too. And just, you know, what was she trying to do? What were her aims? Did she accomplish it? And, and in that sense, you can take yourself out, to, out of it. And on a more practical level, I never read anything about a book that I'm writing about. And I expect reviewers to do that, too. I never read any other reviews. I don't read profiles. I don't read the publicity materials. I don't read jacket copy. Um, I don't read anything. I just read the book. Um, and I try and stay away from it. And if it's a book that I'm really interested in, um, for instance, I recently reviewed the Michael Shaben novel. And I was curious about what other people were saying about that. So I saved those pieces. And then after my piece ran, I read them. But um, I think it's it's really difficult to keep the voices out of your head if anyway, and if you actively are inviting the voices into your head, then it's impossible. Quick, quick piece of info to the question: Should a reviewer read other reviews of a book before reviewing it? Forty percent said no. Seventeen percent or so said yes. It's okay. So I think a lot of us have that feeling that you don't want all of that in your head. I, my quick answer would be just stick to the book, review mm -hmm. the book, because there is so much bullshit in the air, pre-publication reviews, Kakutani killing books in their crib, and so on. And I know there are people around the country, you know, they think that, oh, well, Kakutani killed it, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah. It's dead in the country, because now instead of her review running in one place, it's running in 30 places with all the demise of book reviews we'll talk about on, on Sunday. So, you know, book review editors, you know, who have the privilege of getting all of these books in their offices, you should go to the book, read the first 20 pages, get a sense of what, what it is, keep going, and, and forget about the rest. Other questions? We've got about five minutes. Yeah. Yes, I, uh, I used to review books on a very regular basis in the 80s and 90s, for example, for the daily newspaper in Louisville back when the Binghams owned it. Mm -hmm. And in those days, I was given 350 words to cover a book, and I learned pretty quickly the craft of, A, telling the reader what the book was about, B, you know, giving some idea of how, uh, of how it was stru structured, you know, how it differed from other books on the subject, if it was nonfiction, and C, you know, giving my opinion as to its value. Now, one thing I've noticed about book re uh, newspaper book reviewing in the last uh, 10 years is that in order to compete with the Internet, you have increasingly had a format come up where the pictures get larger and larger and wider and wider margins appear in the text and the type gets larger and larger. Now, back in the 50s, as John Leonard would remember, the New York Times, on a weekday basis, had a column which simply listed the books published that day or that week and gave a two-line description of each one. You know, even, even listing the titles of paperback reprints down at the bottom. And then on Sunday, you would go and, you know, cut, say, spend a page and a half or two pages or a page or half a page, you know, covering the, these books. And, um, you know, if you had a, a picture there, if it was not a photo of the author, it would be, you know, a, a picture that did not necessarily dominated the expense of the text. Can, can you bring it to a question just because we only have a couple of minutes left and I don't want to exclu exclude somebody if they have a question? Now, the question being posed here is how does a book editor balance the need to, ba ba balance the need to, to present a review long enough to give the reader only an idea of what the book is about, but whether the re reviewer regards the book as worthwhile, with uh, this uh, this idea that um, th that uh, page itself as a as a visual thing, you know, is significant. See, 
The Washington Post book world nowadays, one of their full-page reviews is perceptibly shorter than one of the old half-page NYTBR reviews from the 70s. And as a result, the, the, the length of the review almost mandates sometimes that the reviewer can do no more than almost state the jacket copy I, I'm, in I'm going to interview terms. just to say, okay, size matters, and it's a size matters question. You know, the, 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 the misery that graphics has brought into the world of book reviewing is, is infinite, and, and the depth is, uh, is, is we drown in it. Uh, I, I can tell you, as, as say, as a, I've been a television critic for New York Magazine for 23 years, uh, and the and the uh, the page, the number of words that I get to a page uh, uh, in New York Magazine has gone from 1,250 to 750, um, and uh, uh, and to 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 no purpose that I can see except to accommodate teasers and pictures that are bigger than they need to be. Uh, except what gets lost is the consumer guide, which I'm supposedly providing. Uh, with books, it's the, it's the same, but it's more it's a little more complicated. Uh, everybody everybody wants to compete for everybody else's attention, and they and 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 newspapers and magazines feel that they that the only way they can do that is is through graphics, not through better writing or better choices or better bylines or whatever. Uh, they do it. They try to do it through graphics and and through teasing, through telling you what the pe what the piece says before you read it. Uh, all, all of this stuff. Uh, and, however, even at the Times Book Review, which unlike the LA Times, uh, gets a significant amount of book advertising, it's gone way down. It's gone way down. So the, the, the real threat to the book reviewing uh, is the amount of print, period, that a newspaper is willing to devote to, to book reviewing medium. Uh, in, my, in my day at the Times Book Review, we would we would run seventy page issues almost every week, and and uh, uh, you know and it was just and it was the same the New Yorker at that time in the sixties and seventies, you know we th we think of that that as the glory days of John McPhee giving you everything you never wanted to know about oranges in three <laughs> uh, in three separate excerpts, uh, but the fact of the matter is that William Sean had an enormous amount of space because he had an enormous amount of advertising. And we don't have that advertising anymore, and we, do, we certainly don't have it for books. And, uh, and so they never advertised outside uh, in, in, in Boston or, or Los Angeles, they just, or San Francisco, they simp or Chicago. They simply wouldn't do it. But now they're not even advertising in the, in the Times. Uh, they're finding better places to put their, to put, they think better places to put their money. And that's, the that's I'm, a, I'm sorry to say, is the, real, is the real threat. If you look at the... You lose, you've lost about a third of the words, almost everywhere. Yes, you're right, about a, about a third of the words. Uh, uh, but the pages you've lost that you never see are the worst loss. Is there another question, a last question over there? Uh, when an author writes a letter to the editor and says that review really sucked, is there an ethical piece there? Do you always print it, never print it? Um, does the reviewer get to respond? I know different publications handle it differently, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. We, we rarely publish letters to the editor only because of space. Um, and in fact, we're in the process of, I think we're going to start running a letters to the editor column on the website because we have the space. Um, but for me, I mean, it sort of touches back on what John was saying. For me, I, I, given limited space, I'd, I would give the space to a review rather than to a letter, unless it's a letter, unless something egregious has occurred, in which case we need to come clean about it. Um, my general policy wouldn't be to let the reviewer respond only because I feel like it starts a conversation that I'm not sure benefits anyone. Um, and I think the, the real question, too, is, is what is the author, you know, if the author, and you know, we get these letters all the time, if it's just as simply this review sucked and they didn't understand how great my book was, okay, I understand that, I've been there. Um, if it's something where they say this review was wrong or unethical or there's a conflict of interest here that you missed, then, you know, that bears investigation beyond simply publishing the letter and having some kind of response to it. You know, we would then sort of talk to the the, the author, the person who would sent the letter, and find out what it is exactly that they're talking about, and then we'd look into it and see whether there was merit to it. And if there's merit to it, we'd have to do something about it. Um, 
but that's a long roundabout way of answering your question. Uh, uh, something important here. Um, it's almost always a mistake for the author to write that letter. Um, and uh, it, it never looks good. Uh, and if the, if the uh, magazine in question actually allows the reviewer to respond, it's going to look worse. Uh, I remember vividly once um, Alfred Kazin taking grave exception to something that Joan Didion had written in the Times Book Review in my tenure. I can't remember what it was, but he went on and on and on uh, in, high in the highest possible dudgeon, uh, basically saying she was a young whippersnapper and, you know, and had no right to blah, 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 blah. And it was Alfred Kazin. I, I felt I had to run the letter, <laughs> uh, but I also felt that I had to allow uh, Didion a chance to respond. And she did. And what we ran was we ran this long letter from Alfred Kazin, and then it says, Joan Didion replies, oh, come off it, Alfred. <laughs> <laughs> mm. well, guess who won that? You know? the, the, the whippersnapper rose. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, one quick comment uh, just on the shorter reviews uh, d about how ridiculous this is in newspapers then we, we, we can break. Um, in my own case, we had uh, sort of endlessly dwindling reviews until they were down uh, on our daily reviews till about 200 words. And then my legendary editor-in-chief, Gene Roberts, said to me, these reviews aren't worth shit. <laughs> You know? I said, yeah, well, those are your people who are making them not worth shit. They keep pressing it down. So why don't we just get rid of them? I said, well, could I have that space to put it together into at least one more review? Because I agreed they weren't worth anything, uh, and that happened. But sometimes upper editors and newspapers that are not even conscious that their own processes are creating the crap that they then don't like in their own paper. Um, Thank you, everybody. We're going to put out the results of this survey within the next week or so. Some of you are NBCC members. We want to figure out a way that you can get in to all the comments. As I said, 1,800 comments. Fascinating stuff. It's a very funny group, lots of witty material. So we'll get you into that survey, and we'll announce it. And again, thanks to the panelists. Good discussion. <laughs>